Hi everyone and uh, welcome to our first ever Education on Air conference. Uh, today we have educators from across the United States that are holding 46 different hangouts on air uh, with discussions on a number of different topics in education technology. Uh, so first we'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our presenters. Um, they have early access to Hangouts on Air, uh, which is a technology that allows you to broadcast and record Hangouts. Uh, to watch any of these uh, sessions today, simply go to the presenter's Google Plus page um, at the appointed time, so 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern today. Um, and you can find a list of all the sessions um, linked to off of the presenter's Google Plus page. Um, and that's at sites.google.com forward slash site forward slash edu on air forward slash. And I'll post that in the comment stream. Um, so with no further ado, first I, um, I would like to introduce Derek Waddell and um, some background on him. He was a former high school English and technology teacher. Uh, he recently transitioned and is an IT support specialist for Coleman County Schools in Alabama. He is also a Google certified trainer and a blogger at teachthecloud.com. And today Derek is going to be focusing on using Google Apps specifically for school administrators. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll hand it over to Derek. Hi, it's good to be here and it's good to have you guys here. Uh, I, first I want to thank Google for putting on this Education On Air Hangouts. It's been a great experience. I've, I've already done one today and I've seen a couple others and I think it's it's just a great way to share information and, and get information from other educators across the world. Um, basically I'll tell you up front we're going to be talking about Google Apps for School Administrators with a heavy focus on K-12 because that's the environment uh, in, in which I uh, live <laughs> you could say. Uh, so it, it is a K-12 focus uh, it, but that's not to say that higher ed couldn't learn from something from the presentation but uh, you will notice I do have sort of a K-12 slant and, and hopefully as we go I will have a chance for you guys to get involved. Uh, if you'll post uh, questions or comments in, this, in the uh, comment thread on my Google Plus page I'll take time to slow down and answer those as we go and um, if you have something that you would like to share uh, you can post it there too and, and we'll try to get it shared for you. Um, so basically as a school administrator you have you have a very uh, time consuming and difficult job. Uh, so what Google Apps can do is Google Apps can make that job easier and more streamlined and, and help you uh, help you do that job more easily because of organization. It just helps you be more organized. Uh, so I want to start out by telling you about some of the ways we used Google Apps in the school where I worked previously and in the district where I currently work. And I'll show you some of the some of the ways that we've used it. I'll I'll share my screen and show you some of that and talk about it and try to get your your input and feedback too as we go. So first off I'll start with Google Docs. Um, we were talking before, uh, some of us were talking before about uh, what what uh, aspect of Google Apps we enjoy the most or that administrators in our systems or schools enjoy the most. And for me it was forms. When I first started using Google Apps I was using it in my classroom uh, with my students and then we moved to the school level with Google Apps and then we moved to the district level and what sold administrators at the school and district level was the use of, of uh, forms and Google Docs and I'll show you some of the ways we've used it. So let me share with you. Uh, I apologize for using Internet Explorer right now, but I'm signed into a different account. Mm -hmm. please, please don't uh, stone me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but West Point High School is the school where I, where I previously worked. Um, we we used a lot of forms there. Uh, you can see this is a Google site that we used. It's part of the Google App Suite. Uh, but we we also used a lot of forms there. Um, some of the forms that we used, uh, we used an announcements form. Uh, basically, the way it worked before we started using Google Apps is teachers would take a uh, a sticky note 
to the principal's office and he'd have a pile of sticky notes on his desk for announcements. Uh, and he'd make those you know, once a day. And then he would send the sticky notes to me and I would have to type them onto the website. Not a very efficient way to do things. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we created this, this announcements form and basically the teacher typed in their announcement, uh, put in the date they wanted it to end, and it automatically collected the username uh, so we know who had posted it. And it went into the spreadsheet, the Google, Google Doc spreadsheet. Well then what I did was I went into uh, I went into the Google Doc spreadsheet and I published it and linked it on the school website. So when a student or a parent or a teacher went to the website and clicked on announcements, uh, they would see that published spreadsheet. So at that point, any time a teacher posted an announcement, it was automatically posted on the website, which saved me time, saved the principal time, uh, saved everybody time in the end. Uh, we also used used forms for several other things. Uh, we had forms for discipline referrals. Uh, we have several of the principals in our school district have, have set up Google Forms for informal walkthroughs uh, so that they can use uh, walking through with a tablet, uh, have a Google Form pulled up on the tablet, a couple of quick check boxes, hit submit. It goes back to the spreadsheet in their office and when they get back to their desktop or their laptop, they can sit down and review uh, what they saw during the walkthrough. Uh, we've used forms for uh, parent night sign-ins. We have an eighth grade parent night where the eighth graders and their parents came in. And at, at one point in time, our guidance counselor would have a sign-in sheet. And the parents would put their, their, for their contact information onto the sign-in sheet. And then when the guidance counselor got back to her office, she would type it all in. To, uh, to a spreadsheet so that she had all that information. But this way what we did is we set up uh, several laptops inside the door and when the parents came in they would fill out the form on the laptop. All the information automatically went into the spreadsheet for her. So the guidance counselor didn't have to go back and change any of that stuff later. Um, we used forms for, we did a safe school tip line uh, for students to report uh, bullying, uh, drug use, any of that kind of stuff. And what we did is we uh, took the link to the form and made a QR code and hung that code around school so that if a student saw somebody getting bullied, uh, they could take out their cell phone, smartphone, scan the QR code and fill out the form right there. And the principals had it set up so that they got a notification every time uh, a form was filled out. And it, it, just, it came in really handy. Um, we've also used docs for other things. So we, we use docs for um, shared sports calendar. I'm sorry, shared sports calendars. Uh, what the way that worked is we had a spreadsheet that was shared with the coaches and the AD. And so when the coaches edited a schedule, every other coach saw, saw the edit and could plan accordingly. Uh, and the athletic director also saw the, the change. In the, in the spreadsheet. Uh, so really, really good ways to use docs to share with each other and, and streamline the process. Uh, Craig, do you have any ways that, that your uh, administrators in your area are using Google Docs? Well, we had been using other products before like SurveyMonkey and some things that we switched over to Google Docs because they're, it's easier for them the cost is a lot less. But we've done our entire uh, parent and teacher surveys, I guess, that we'd have to do for our school improvement plans and put a link out on our website. And we had more parents respond that way than we ever did when we put it out in the paper-based form. And like you said, the walkthroughs, we're working on that right now, trying to find the, not just the, the uh, walkthrough, like, the informal, but to actually do a formal teacher evaluation and be able to do it on their iPad and, and have that right there. You can put the, uh, the link right on your desktop on your, on your main page so when they want to get to it, they don't need to go to Safari and then go to bookmarks. They can just tap on it and go straight to that form and start filling it out. Uh, 
mention many of the different things that we are that we're doing. The, the bullying one has been real useful for us, at the middle school in particular, to so that the students are doing it anonymously and we're getting input that we probably wouldn't have gotten in other cases like that. So those are the, the ones I can think of that we're doing right now. Great. Thanks for sharing. Uh, well, do, do we have any questions or comments from the from the Google Plus thread? Uh, let's see. We have one from Curtis Fuller who says, regarding bullying posting, I read recently that forms have been pulled for having personal information being collected. Wouldn't bullying reports include a lot of such personal information? Okay. Um, we we've never had any issue with with the collection of personal information. We anonymize our form, so so there's no uh, no collection of personal information. Um, I I can't speak to that because I've never seen that as an issue. Uh, Craig? Yeah, I followed the discussion on that too, and, and they they were pulled, and it was because they were asking not for email addresses, but actually asking for passwords or social security or those types of things that a spammer would be uh, setting up, you know, for farming, trying to get that kind of information. So just asking for parent information and a phone number and an email address would not get it pulled. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Any uh, anything else um, there? Yep. It looks like Tanya um, asked, was wondering if there is a way to approve an entry from a Google form before it drops into the spreadsheet itself. Uh, thereby opening up a form like announcement to students. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's not a way to uh, approve it before it posts into the spreadsheet, uh, but you can set up notifications uh, in, the, in the spreadsheet so that as soon as one is posted, you'll get an, an email notification uh, saying that somebody has submitted and then you can delete uh, we never opened it up to students because of that functionality. We uh, we left it open to teachers only, and required a teacher email address to be able to to use the announcement form. Um, but there is that you know that off chance that some teacher will post something that uh, doesn't need to be posted online. So uh, you do have the ability to go in and edit afterward, and the ability to get a notification as soon as a submission is made. Okay. Um, so one other thing that you could do is, is create a second sheet. And with that second sheet, have, on, the, on the main sheet, have, have an approved call. And then on the second sheet, just pull over those items to it that have been approved. And then just publish the second sheet. Absolutely. It gives you a little more work on the back end, but it also, uh, it also gives you more control over what's posted. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, with that, we'll move on to Google Calendar, and I'll talk to you about some of the ways we, we've used Google Calendar uh, to kind of streamline the administrative process. Um, Calendar has a lot of functions. Uh, you can plan and schedule team meetings, uh, send invitations to other, other members so that you know who can attend and who can't attend that day or at that time. Um, but we used it a lot for... Um, and I'll just show you. We use it a lot for reservations. Uh, so you can see this is our our computer lab calendar, and the computer lab calendar is shared with every teacher at the school, and every teacher at the school has edit access to the calendar. So if a teacher wants to reserve the computer lab, uh, then all that teacher has to do is pull up the computer lab calendar on his or her um, computer and then they can put their own times down and, and change their times. And we also have it for our, our library for teach, uh, teachers to schedule library time. Uh, we have that one set up a little bit differently. The librarian wanted a little more control and so she set it up so that only she could edit but everybody could see so that teachers could go on and see when the library was scheduled and then email the librarian, library media specialist with a time and a date, and the library media specialist would put them onto the calendar. So there are a couple of different ways you can do it, but what I like about it is before we had 
a calendar, uh, a paper calendar on top of the filing cabinet in the center, in the office. And so anytime anybody wanted to uh, schedule the computer lab or the library, they had to go to the office, look through the, look through the calendar, and write their name in. And, and then the next teacher would have to do the same thing. This way, everybody has uh, access to see who has things uh, reserved, who is going to be in there at that point in time, and they said they're able to work it into their, their lessons and their schedules a little more easily. Uh, we've used that for everything from scheduling the gymnasium to scheduling the, uh, the mobile labs, uh, all that kind of stuff. It just makes it a lot easier to kind of share uh, those calendars and see what everybody's doing so that you don't overlap. So one of the things, you know, along with that is in our district, we've got 19 buildings and then our central office, and we have numerous different conference rooms. So we've set it up so that any administrator can check and see which conference rooms at the district office are available, what meetings are scheduled, but only central office administrators can actually schedule that meeting. And again, getting away from what you said, we used to have to walk down to our you know, the main entrance to the building and go to a sheet and then we have to had to check to see what was available or call down there. So that's made it a lot easier for us. And now our, our individual buildings are taking that on and doing the same type of scheduling you were talking about, even for their IEP meetings and the gymnasiums and, and all those types of things. Yeah. Absolutely. Just makes things so much easier. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, managing, you know, through the resource calendar is something that we use internally at Google as well, is booking conference rooms and, and other resources. So not, you know, it works across, uh, you know, Google and EDUs. So everyone benefits. <laughs> Perfect. Um, moving on to sites. Uh, we've also used sites quite a bit. Um, all of our district and school websites are, are run through Google Sites now. Um, and as you saw, I pulled up West Point High School's uh, website earlier, and it's it's a, a good website. Uh, the functionality in Google Sites has come a long way since since Google Sites first came out. Uh, so much you can do with it. Uh, just makes makes communication with parents, embedding social media, uh, putting those announcements on there, embedding the calendar. It just makes communication with parents so much easier. Um, being able to edit it anywhere, anytime, any place, as long as you have an internet connection, uh, it just makes it so easy to update. We've also started, and we've just started this, um, we've just started using uh, Google Sites for uh, community sites for committees. Uh, so what we're doing, and I'll, I'll see if I can pull one up and show you. Um, basically what we're doing there is we've taken a site and we've embedded a shared calendar into it. Uh, we've embedded a discussion group, a Google group into it uh, so that you have an embedded discussion forum. Uh, we've given, we've got a shared links page where uh, anyone who is a part of that committee has access to post and share links. And then we have a link to a shared documents collection in Google Drive uh, where people can share their documents and collaborate on documents in real time. Uh, and so all of the collaboration takes place for instead of having a calendar, uh, your group, your links, and your documents all in separate places, uh, the Google site gives you the fact that all of those services are integrated gives you the ability to easily uh, put all those things in one place. So. Um, Collaborating is a lot easier that way. Mm -hmm. uh, any any way you're using sites where you are, Craig? Uh, personally, I've turned everything that I do, as far as workshops and presentations and things, into into sites. I'm doing all my things and setting that as an example to our to our principals. But we've got a a web you know a, a website company that we deal with so that every teacher has their own site and it's populated by our our school student information system, which are some things, you know, above and beyond what we could ever expect to do with sites. Uh, but more of the things we want to get out just to the public for 
organizations and groups and things like that we're doing through sites. Um, I was just trying to find the, the link here just to bring up one that I use. I think I passed it on to you, but um, I'll, I'll find it and just throw it out there into the, into the chat. The, okay. the, the types of things, and also I'm teaching a graduate class to our local university, and my entire course is all based on, on Google Sites. Oh, absolutely. And, and when I was in the classroom, uh, I taught computer applications classes. And my entire classroom was paperless uh, through the use of Google Docs and Google Sites. And it, it just being able to access that so quickly and easily makes everything great. But on the administrative side, that the fact that you can share a site uh, within a group of people and give groups of people access to edit certain parts of the site without editing other parts of the site, uh, just the collaboration element, uh, especially committees and, and teams and that kind of stuff, just uh, makes the administrative side of it so much easier. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I can speak more on the, the higher education side of things, but the use cases are pretty transferable. Um, you know, we have Brown University that's using Google Sites to host their entire student newspaper. And so one of the things that they were looking for was just not having to worry about backing up data. Um, so knowing that it's all going to be stored there and not having to worry about, you know, thinking hard drives and making sure you've saved everything and um, being able to edit it there. Um, and then also, similarly, Clemson University uses Google Sites to um, create student portfolios. So for, you know, a student's four years at Clemson, it becomes a, a way to, you know, a repository of all their relevant information, their coursework, um, you know, documents they've written, resumes. Um, so as was mentioned, you know, it's just a really good way to combine all the apps together. Absolutely. One of the things I've found with Google Sites, it's so easy to embed you know, things into it. Much easier than most sites or websites have ever tried to deal with. Oh yeah, especially if they're Google products. Embedding a Google document or a Google calendar into a Google site is, is two clicks, three clicks maybe. Uh, just so easy. Okay, do we have any questions so far about uh, docs or sites or calendar or how, how we use it? Nope, it, there were some good links posted in there um, about, you know, scheduling appointments for parent-teacher conferences within Calendar and the, the new appointment time slots uh, launch within Calendar, um, so that was posted there, but um, no questions just yet. Okay. Oh, yeah, that, that's great. The appointment time slot, that's uh, really, really good stuff there. I haven't used it uh, extensively yet, but I have played around with it a little bit. And it looks like it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. um, while I have a chance, I'll pull up. Uh, Craig, you shared that site link with me. So I'll pull it up. And you can just you can see how how easy it is here to um, to just put all of your stuff in one place. So that's the example of the, uh, it's a two-day workshop I'm doing around North Dakota for our administrators, uh, professional development organization. And when they first sign up for it, they, of course, they want the graduate credit. But you know, it's always like, well, how can you spend two days teaching us how to search Google? <laughs> and then they find out, you know, there's a lot more to it. And, and like we talked about before, calendars and forms are probably the two biggest things that administrators buy into. Absolutely. And I've seen that every, everywhere I've been, forms and calendar to the, the biggest. Now, I want to take a minute or a few minutes, the rest, probably the rest of the time we have, and talk about Gmail. Uh, because email is one of those, uh, every administrator knows how important email is. Um, if your email goes down for two hours, it's, it's a problem. Um, one of the great things about Google Apps is the 99.9% the .9 uptime. Uh, so it very rarely goes down, and when it does, it's back up very quickly. Um, but Gmail does have a little bit of a different interface than some administrators are used to. I know that uh, where I am, one of the things that was a big drawback when we moved to Google Apps was the, the 
the fight that we had of people who wanted to keep their Outlook because we, we moved from Microsoft Exchange. Um, and while you can use Outlook to manage your email uh, as an ISI map or pop, the functionality that you have inside the Gmail web proper is just so far above and beyond what you can do inside a client like Outlook or Thunderbird or anything like that. Uh, so I want to take a minute and I want to show you some of the things you can do in Gmail to kind of streamline the process and make things easier for you. Um, I, I love G Gmail. I've, I've been using it for years and uh, you, won't, you won't talk me into going back to anything else. So, um, so let me pull up uh, an inbox for you, and this is just a this is just a dummy uh, Google Apps account that I have set up um, just to uh, to do training. So I don't really have a whole lot of email in here, and anything you see in here is not gonna uh, <laughs> cost me my job. Uh, yeah. Chassis, you can see that that's my lovely wife. So. Uh, she's helped me out a few times by giving me some fake emails to play with. Uh, so first thing I want to show you is how your email is actually set up. Uh, I have mine set up in a, uh, a priority inbox. You can change the, the way your inbox looks by going to the inbox here and you have several different options. Uh, you have classic which is um, the you know the classic format of the most recent messages at the top of the screen. Uh, you have important first, so that the uh, the messages that are marked important uh, through Google's algorithm and Google checks. You know, uh, is it something that somebody that you communicate with often, uh, depending on who you send it to or who it's from, uh, it's going to put it mark it important or not. You can make unread show up at the top, so if you want all of your old messages to be below and all of your unread messages at the top, uh, you can set it up that way. You can do starred messages first. Uh, and starred messages, you can just star a message by checking the star, clicking the star next to it. Uh, I've seen people use stars in different ways. I personally, I use stars to remind me to reply to an email. So if I have an email that I need to reply to, I'll star it. Or if it's something important that I need to make sure I go back and revisit, I'll star it so that it it shows up there. And you can make sure all those starred messages flow to the top. Or you can use Priority Inbox, which is what I use, which is kind of a combination of all of the others. Um, and you can see, if I had an unread message, which I don't, but if I had an unread message, it would show up here at the top section. And then right below that, all of my starred messages show up. And then underneath that is everything else. And every, everything else is in uh, chronological order. So the, the newest messages show up first, and the older messages show up at the bottom. OK. Um, do we have any questions so far about uh, uh, the different types of inboxes or, or how to customize those? We didn't get any questions on Gmail, but there was a, a question um, of referring back to Drive, if you don't mind backpedaling just a bit. Sure. Um, so it was in reference to um, syncing documents to a local machine, and they were wondering if there was any way. Let me just pull it up. Sorry, I just lost it. Um, Ed Gonzalez wrote, um, we talked about Google Drive and the concerns that people have with the caching feature. Can it be turned off so confidential documents are not on the local machine? That is a good question that I can't answer because I haven't had a whole lot of time to play with Drive yet. Uh, it's so new, I just I really haven't I've had a lot of time to dig into it. Could you? Can you address that? Yeah, I can speak to it a bit. So um, the, I'm fairly certain that there's not a way to sync only specific documents to to the machine. Um, but uh, you know, I, I will. I'm going to do some research right now, as you know, as Derek continues, and I'll see if I can get a more concrete answer for you. But I'm fairly certain, pretty much once Drive is installed, that the sync just happens automatically, and there isn't a way to to turn it off for a specific document. But let me look it up, and I'll have an answer to you by the by the end of the hangout for sure. I, actually, I have an answer right now. Um, if if you have Drive installed, uh, and you you right click on Drive and open the preferences. 
uh, you'll see in the preferences you have sync options and you can sync certain folders and not sync other folders. So if you have confidential information that you don't want pulled down to your machine, uh, you can uh, uncheck those folders so that they don't sync. Perfect. Okay. Nice. See, I just needed you to stall for a minute. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> <Good work. laughs> okay. Um, well, I guess we'll go back to email. Let's see. We, we do have one more forms question while we're okay. on the docs. Um, the question was posed by Michelle, and she said, um, let's see, you have the ability to have form responses emailed to you. Can they be emailed to additional users within the domain? Uh, sure, as long as they're shared on the document. Uh, if you share that document with those users, then uh, they, can, they can receive notifications as well. Okay, anything else? I think we're good for now. Okay. Uh, so back on email, um, you can create labels uh, in, e in email. Uh, basically, if you're familiar with pretty much any uh, mail client like Outlook or anything like that, any, any mail service, you know they all have folders. And so you can do that functionality uh, in, in Gmail. Uh, if you click more here on the left, uh, you can create labels. So, you know, you can create a label and say, you know, I want my label to be um, faculty. So I, I need a faculty label. And so now you'll see it shows up over here on the left-hand side as a new label. Uh, and basically when I say label, just, just think folder. If you're, uh, It works basically the same way. There are a few differences, but basically works like a folder would work. Uh, you can change the colors so that, you know, it's a different color than your other labels. Uh, say you want a specific uh, specific user, a specific folder underneath that, you can create nested labels. So if I create a label for Miss Lee and I nest the label, I can nest it under uh, faculty. And so now I have a nested label under that that I can add more emails to. Uh, and once you have the labels, it's really easy. There are several different ways you can add emails uh, to, to your labels or add labels to your emails. Uh, you can click them here and drag them over and drop them. Uh, you can check the box next to them and use this label move to and move it that way. Uh, or you can do it from inside the email. So you can open up the email and then you can move it. And now you'll see it. I have in that label. If I click on that label, I can see them all right there. Now, personally, I don't use uh, labels. I use the thing that Google is good at, the search function. So in your email at the top, you can see that you have a search box. Uh, and what's great about um, about Gmail, uh, first of all, you see down here I have uh, 10 gigabytes of space, uh, which Google just recently upped from 7. Uh, but I have 10 gigabytes of space, and I can I can keep emails. I, I've been using my personal Gmail account for uh, over 10 years now. I guess about 10 years, and I haven't deleted an email from that account unless it was some sort of spam. So every email I've ever gotten that was of any importance, I still have, uh, and I'm not using anywhere close to my 10 gigabytes of, data, of space. Uh, but what what comes with that is the fact that you then have the problem of organi organizing those emails. Now I could take the time to create labels and I can move stuff in the labels and do it that way. But to me, that's just more time that I don't really have. Um, so for me, it's just a matter of coming up here and doing a quick search. A uh, couple of ways you can search. You can search from. So if I want to search for emails from a particular person, uh, I can type in from colon, and I can search for uh, emails from, and then search, and it will show me all of the emails that were sent to me from that person. 
Uh, in the same instance, I can do two. So if I search two and search for emails to a particular person, I haven't sent any emails to that person. Mm -hmm. But if I had, they would show up there. Um, I can search by subject. So I know if I know uh, if I know a subject includes the word um, faculty meeting, I can search for the word faculty in every subject, and it will return the, the emails that have the word faculty in the subject line. Um, I can search for things that have an attachment. If I use uh, has colon attachment, uh, it'll pull back results that have an attachment. I don't have any emails that have an attachment, but if I did, uh, it would pull back all of the emails that have an attachment. Um, if you know the specific file name for the attachment, you can even use the file name uh, search and search for a specific file name. Um, What's great is though you can use all that stuff in conjunction. So if I know I sent an email or I got an email from a particular person and that that particular email has the word faculty in the subject and it also has an attachment, I can search for all of that stuff at once and it will return those, those emails to me. Um, so quickly and easily I've found the email I was looking for without having to go through uh, 50 different labels and dig down and scroll back to a particular date to see if I can find it. Um, you even have, if you pull down this arrow, you can even fill out the form there without having to use those modifiers. So you can search for from to subject uh, has the words, has an attachment. Uh, you can search for a date range. So if you know it was within one month of today, uh, you could put one month of today's date, and it would search for just emails within that certain date range. Uh, so the search functionality just makes makes your life so much easier uh, because you don't have to spend all your time organizing your emails. Craig, is there anything you want to add to the, the Gmail functionality? Well, I don't know if you're going to go into it later or not, but the big selling point you, to administrators is the fact you can put things into groups, and it could be parent groups, you know, whatever it would be, and then just send that email out to that you know, without having to know everybody's individual email or put it in every time you send that message out. Sure, absolutely. So, and you have, a, you have a couple of different ways you can do groups. Uh, you have... Uh, Google Groups for Business, which you can do set up on the administrative side of Google Apps so that you have uh, particular people in the organization in a group and then those people in that organization can participate in a discussion forum type, uh, type group or through an email. And you also have in your contacts, and I can actually uh, pull that up and show it, I can't, I can't really show uh, the other since I don't have groups enabled for my domain. But I will pull this other up and show. Um. If I can get my screen selected. There we go. Uh, so if yeah, if you go into your contacts area, uh, you can then create a new group. Uh, and, and let's say I want to name my group faculty or I wanted to name my group second grade teachers. And then I can use this plus sign and I can add all of the people uh, I want to into that. So if I wanted to add. So now that person is in the group. And I can add as many people to the group as I want. And then from, from there on out, when I send an email, uh, if I compose a new email and I want to send it to second grade teachers, I can just type it in there and it would send it to all of those people instead of me having to type in every single email address every single time. Uh, that's great. I'm glad you brought that up. The other, um, I guess, selling point with it is, and I'm assuming that if you've had this for 10 years that you don't have all those messages in your inbox, and that is to use the filter so you can automatically filter things off and uh, 
you know, things coming from vendors or something that you're going to look at when you have time. That was my next step, actually. I was, I was just about to get into that. So with Gmail filters, uh, you have a lot of options. Um, and this is, one of the, this is one of those things that um, once I show administrators, this becomes a lifeline for them. Because what happens is you get flooded with emails. Administrators get flooded with emails all the time. Sometimes they're from vendors. Uh, sometimes they're from a particular teacher that maybe emails you 60 times a day. Uh, you know, so, sometimes it's just spam that you don't want to read. So there are ways to get rid of that. Uh, so to do so, uh, you can go into the settings and you can create filters there. Uh, you can go into settings uh, and you can go to filters and you can create filters there. Uh, but you can also do it from, uh, and I'll, just, I'll show you through the process here. So if I wanted to create a new filter, I can click create new filter here. Uh, and I can filter by several different options. I, have the, I can filter from a specific email address. Uh, I can filter by subject line. So if I'm getting things with the subject um, Facebook, I can filter out Facebook notifications. Uh, if I um, want to filter out certain words in the email, if I want to filter out emails that have an attachment, I don't ever want to receive another attachment, I could. Uh, so let's just say I want to I eliminate emails from um, uh, with the subject Facebook. And then I click Create Filter. And then it asks me what I want to do with that filter. Uh, so basically, I have several options. I can skip the in inbox ent entirely. Excuse me. Uh, I can mark it as red. I can star it. Uh, and I can do any conjunction of these. So let's say uh, I want this to go into, uh, I want to skip the inbox. I want to mark it as red. And I want to delete it. OK? Uh, so then when I create the filter, now every email that I get that has that in, that in the subject will get all of those things and I will never see them again. Uh, I can also filter by clicking on a, an email, opening up an email, uh, and I'll go up here to more and I'll go to filter messages like these. And so basically what happens then, it says okay that's from that email address, I'm going to create a filter with that email address, it asks me what I want to do with it. Uh, I want to apply this label, and I also want to mark it, mark it as red. Now, also, once I've, if I have actually have emails from that that match that filter, it will give me this uh, also apply to, so I can apply this filter to the ones that already exist. And now, every email that I have is match that matches that filter will have the that function done to it, and also any email I get that matches that filter in the future uh, will also get that applied to it. All right, anything you want to add to the filters, Greg? No. Um, anything? Are you still going to continue to talk about Gmail? Um, well, I think I'm done with Gmail. If you have something okay. you want to add, well, just a big selling point um, that I use with administrators because many administrators are at that point where they're looking at retirement and they're going to lose their school email account. They're, they might move from the city that they're at, so they're going to lose their local ISP. And I just keep telling them they'll never lose that Google email account. And you want to start moving all your personal stuff. If you have people that you want to contact you after you retire, not the vendors and not the state DPI and stuff, but your friends start moving towards a, you know, a Gmail account. And that sells a lot of them. They start to see the personal value in you. Absolutely. And, and plus, the, uh, the fact that all of your Google Apps information is portable, uh, dataliberation.org, uh, if you're a Google Apps user or you're thinking about Google Apps and you're you're wondering, okay, how do I make sure the information is mine? Uh, Google Apps lets you take all of your information with you if you leave. So it lets you export your, your sites, all of your documents, all of your emails, uh, and dataliberation.org. Uh, if we could throw that into the, into the chat, the yeah, link to that. It. Thanks. That's, that's one of the, my favorite things about Google is that if, if I get fed up with Google and I want to leave, which is probably not going to happen, but if I do, I can I can get all of my stuff and I can take it with me. 
Okay, any other, do we have any questions? Anybody that's, that's posted any? Uh... Yeah, so there's been some discussion just around um, a, a general deployment, um, you know, setting up a pilot, um, kind of things like that. I know we're not specifically focused on deployment here, but you know, if you do, if you are willing to share any best practices there, um, I'm sure you have some wisdom as a certified trainer. So, Sure, um, I can tell you what we did and what we did worked, so uh, I always suggest it. Mm -hmm. uh, I piloted originally in my classroom with my students. Uh, I started with students uh, because if you get students excited, they're going to bug teachers enough that teachers are going to get excited too. No, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, we did. We piloted it in my classroom with my students, uh, my computer application students, uh, for one semester. And then after that, it was the second semester of, of the school year. So after that second semester, then we moved to the school level. Uh, and we had teachers and students at the same level in the Google Apps domain. Um, and then after that, we moved on to the district level and we kept it actually separate. Uh, I'm, I'm like Craig, I'm in a large school district. We have 29 schools uh, in my school district. And so the district has their own uh, Google Apps domain just for teachers. And then they leave it up to each school whether or not they want to use Google Apps with the students. And so the school is responsible for uh, administering the Google Apps domain at their individual school for their students. Uh, that's that's what we did, and it worked well for us. Uh, and I, I've talked to other people who always suggest starting starting small and and growing. And if you can start with a small group uh, over the summer, it's even better. Uh, when we moved to a, a district wide Google Apps implementation, we did it uh, right at the end of the school year, so that during the summer we could have training and we could bring uh, local school technology coordinators and uh, school administrators and that, that type of person up and, and train them on the new, uh, the new Google Apps implementation. So, mm -hmm. Craig? Well, we've been using Google Docs back, I think it used to be called Rightly.com or something before Google brought them in. So we've been doing it within our own staff development with teachers for a long time. And um, I am a Google certified teacher and uh, got exposed to the whole idea of the, the uh, domain and having our own Google domain. So we implemented it right away district wide. Uh, one domain for teachers, for students, um, inclusive. And we're able to create the account straight from our SIS. So we don't, uh, new students, of course, we, we do put in uh, one at a time if we need the account right away. But for the most part, we just do a mass account. Every student has it. I'm not saying every teacher uses it, but uh, we've got our tech coaches, our tech integrators out there in every school, working, plotting, doing everything we can to to get people to, to buy into the value of it. And I, and I think it's going to depend on your implementation, too. Uh, with us, it was we, we ditched Microsoft Exchange. Well, at the school level, we ditched... Uh, a gaggle, and then at the district level, we ditched Microsoft Exchange and moved solely to uh, Google Apps for our email client. And we also ditched uh, uh, our webs our website solution and moved solely to Google Apps for that. Uh, if you're using it like we are as a full implementation for everything, it's going to be a little bit different than if you're using it as supplementary. I know several systems who who they give access to it, but it's not. Uh, they also use Microsoft Exchange for their email and then Google Apps for document collaboration. Uh, so it's really going to depend on how you want to implement and, and to what extent you want to implement and how familiar your, your uh, base is with the solution. So you know, in some cases, if you're a smaller school district and you have uh, tech-savvy teachers and tech-savvy administrators, uh, rolling it out all at once could be, could be fine. Uh, but with us working, uh, working with a small group and then up to a larger group and then up to the largest group uh, worked best for us. So. so, you know, just a couple of other things as we're talking about just all of these different apps for administrators. Hangouts an example. People are buying into that, being able to, to uh, just pull up and have a meeting uh, 
on the spot without having to everybody drive to one location and be able to do it. And in our city, we went through a major flood this past year. Um, we lost six school buildings, totally destroyed. But we were then using Google Maps to be able to put in student locations. And we didn't have a big GIS system so we could go and find out where everybody lived. Well, we were able to do that using Google Maps and a couple of other tools, and things like that. And then our superintendent did a public forum where he had a big PowerPoint presentation. And, and uh, the question is, the people that weren't there, how did they get to see it? Well, we uploaded it into, into Google Docs. It converted it into a Google presentation and lost its transitions, but all the content was there and made it available to the entire public. So just some little features like that that, you know, all the different apps have some reason for an administrator to learn how to use it and see the value behind it. I agree. Any other, do we have any other questions or comments before we go? Uh, nope, I think we're, um, people were really thankful for addressing the, the last question about deployment, so that was really helpful, but uh, no other comments from the, the live stream. Okay. Well, I, I don't have anything else. Uh, uh, Greg, if you have anything so, else before we well, go. I've, I've got a question. Okay. Um, my total understanding is when we deploy it within our own domain, we don't have to worry about SIPA and uh, the age of 13 before we can give students access to the accounts and stuff. Uh, now I've heard a little bit of discussion on, on some of our Google boards that other schools don't feel that way. I think the the key there is the onus is on the school district to be in compliance. Uh, so Google itself doesn't have uh, um, compliance built in. You you are responsible for making sure you have the uh, parental permission for students under 13. And correct me if I'm wrong, Devin. No, yeah, I mean, that's it. You'll just, yeah, it, it's an acceptable use policy at your school that you'll need to, to make certain that end users are okay to use before, uh, you know, before they access their account. Now, as, as far as privacy goes, uh, Google Apps is under a different uh, privacy policy than, than standard Gmail and standard Google Docs and stuff. So the privacy... And that, that's one thing that Google Apps does really well, is they're, they're very dedicated to making sure that privacy concerns are addressed and that all of your information stays private, all of your information stays yours. Um, so uh, the people that are worried, and I, I posted about this earlier on, on uh, Google+, Plus, a lot of people were worried when Google Drive came out uh, about the privacy implications and, and this and that. And what what I pointed out was the new privacy policy for Google Drive does not apply for uh, Google Apps for Education users because it's under it's ruled under a different set of privacy policies. So my understanding is that it's the same as if we were running our own server with our own data in our school district and giving out our own school own email accounts because technically we own our Google domain and everything that's within it. So I'm just seeing it as an extension of what we're doing within our school district, but it's just hosted by Google for us. Yeah, so on the note of Drive, because it's um, built directly into Docs, it's, it's actually considered one of the core services. Um, so it is covered under the, the Apps for EDU agreement. Um, and then, you know, as you mentioned, also all data, all content that's created within a Google Apps domain is... Um, it, you know, is not owned by Google, uh, so we can't outright state that you own it either just because if you copy and paste from Wikipedia, you don't own that data either. Um, but again, Google does not own it, and if you want to export it at any time, that's the website that was given earlier, the, the dataliberation.org. Um, and then, you know, again, on privacy, all customer data is treated as confidential information and is stored with the same uh, level of security and privacy and on the same servers as Google's uh, internal data. So, um, you know, definitely treated confidentially. So. And I have a feeling that Google's uh, engineers take privacy pretty seriously. <laughs> it's a big deal, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to say the least. 
Okay, any other questions or, or comments from anybody in the stream or? Um, just a, just a nitty gritty one from Patrick on shared contacts, but shared calendars, but I'll, I'm going to follow up offline on that one. So. Okay. Well, good deal. Thanks, everybody, for, for coming out. Uh, thank you, Devin and Craig, for uh, helping out and getting in the conversation. I think it was a, a good conversation, and uh, yeah. if I can be of any service, please let me know. Yep, I'll I'll, um, I'll give a plug for Derek. You know, thank you so much. So his resources are going to be available at teachthecloud.com, um, and then you can, you know, he is available to be contacted at DerekWaddell.com, and I will post um, both the links that I just mentioned in the comment stream on his uh, Google Plus page, so you'll be able to access them there as well. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Have a good day.